Hello and welcome to Ditching Hourly. I'm Jonathan Stark. Today I've got a very special episode for you. I'm joined by value pricing pioneer Ron Baker. Ron is a recovering CPA, his words, who began value pricing in 1989. He's the author of seven best-selling books, including Pricing on Purpose, Measure What Matters to Customers, and Implementing Value Pricing. He's the founder of pricing think tank Verisage Institute and a radio talk show host on the voiceamerica.com show, The Soul of Enterprise. This episode clocks in at nearly an hour, which I realize is longer than usual, but you're going to want to listen to every single minute of it because Ron drops nonstop value bombs. Enjoy. Ron, welcome to the show. Jonathan, thrilled to be here. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. So today we are going to talk about the eight steps to value pricing from your book, Implementing Value Pricing. But before we get into that, could you tell folks a little bit about who you are and what you do? Wow. Okay. Uh, I'm a recovering CPA. (laughs) (laughs) I think sometimes mine stands for car parking attendant, but uh, (laughs) I started my life in a big eight accounting firm. And of course I was taught to bill by the hour. In fact, even before that, during college, I worked as a bookkeeper accountant, put my way through college and, and I billed by the hour and I filled out timesheets and, um, you know, going into work for the big eight just reinforced that when I left, I started my own practice and I learned really fast that the billable hour is a really lousy customer experience. And I looked at my partner one day and said, you know, there's got to be a better way to do this. Why can't we just do what every other business does and give a price up front? And so we experimented with it. Now, this was in 1989, Jonathan. There was nothing out there on it. Nobody, at least in the professional circuit, was talking about it. There were no books on it. We probably made every mistake under the sun, but we stuck with it solely because we thought it was a better customer experience. It really didn't have anything to do with the economics or anything like that. We just thought it was giving customer certainty and prices what they wanted, like a fixed rate mortgage versus a variable rate mortgage. Most of us pick a fixed rate and it works so well. It enabled us to not only upgrade our customer base, but also it enabled us to get rid of timesheets, which I ditched right away. And then I started teaching about this. And then I wrote a book in 1998 that ended up selling 40,000 copies around the world. Uh, Since then, I've written six books on this topic and I speak around the world. I started a think tank in 2001 called Verisage. And I don't practice anymore. I sold my interest out to my partner and I've been doing this full time. And, you know, I tell people my quest in life is to bury the billable hour and the timesheet across all professional firms. Excellent. Well, we share that mission. So I applaud you. <laughs> <laughs> I know you do. I've listened to your podcast, by the way. I love it. It's, it's, it's great. It's just, it's great to see so many people out there now talking about this and, you know, really pushing these ideas. So I'm, I'm just thrilled. I agree. I, I mean, I think it's a, it'll make the world a better place if people are focused on creating value instead of, you know, punching the clock. Right. Okay, great. So that's a perfect place for us to start. I think that's good background. Um, I, I guess it makes more sense to start at step one. Well, the eight steps to value pricing is something I laid out in, in my latest book on this topic called Implementing Value Pricing. And the, um, the subtitle is A Radical Business Model for Professional Firms. And what I mean by radical is the Latin getting back to the root. I think ever since the billable hour and the timesheet regime entered our lives and it, and it came in through the legal profession, by the way, in 1919. So we're coming up on a hundred year anniversary of this, but I think ever since it's been introduced, it's, it's taken our focus away from value. It's taking our focus away from measuring what matters to the customer. We log hours on a timesheet. If you do that enough in six minute increments, you believe that's the inventory the customer's buying and yet no customer buys time. It, you know, I often joke with, with professionals that it's like, if you opened a sushi restaurant, your sign would say cold, dead fish, (laughs) you know, that's not what people are buying from you. It is time. They're buying outcomes. And yet, because you're measuring time, focusing on time, focusing on the tasks, you're doing it at the expense of focusing on the outcome. It's kind of like when a friend or a loved one has a baby. You don't want to hear about the labor pains. You want to see the baby. (laughs) Well, the customer wants to see the baby, and yet we're measuring the labor pains and billing for them in six-minute contractions. It makes no sense. (laughs) Uh, You're always always great with a line. I love it. 
Um, I mean, it, you're preaching to the choir here, so I, I really, I could ask you questions all day, but you know, I, I get it. And I think people listening get it, but there's a difference between understanding the concept and, and feeling, you know, cause, cause every, nobody likes billing by the hour. Everybody hates it, uh, but they don't know what else to do. And even once they sort of drink the Kool-Aid that it's a bad idea and a value pricing approach is a better idea, they still have a hard time making the leap. Because it's, it's just literally people just like, okay, I believe you, but what do I do? Right. Right. No, I know it, it is, it is a big problem because we, I think it's the unlearning that needs to take place. That's the hard part. You know, learning something new is not that difficult. We all do it all the time, but the unlearning, pushing out the old ideas and the old methods, uh, so you can make room for the new ones. I think sometimes it's really difficult. By the way, just parenthetically, there's a great video on this. If you just Google the backward bicycle, um, that's kind of how we um, explain this change. It's like riding a backward bicycle. This guy's trying to ride a bike that when you turn the handlebars to the right, the wheel goes to the left. And you think you can do this, but it's really hard. It took him, took him eight months to be able to do it. And that's kind of what this move from hourly billing to value pricing is because there's so much unlearning. You have to rewire the algorithms in your brain and it's not easy. But, you know, what I always tell people, look, this is done one customer at a time. You move at a pace that's comfortable for you. You don't have to do it all at once. It's one customer at a time. And so we've laid out an eight step framework to help folks make this transition. That's pretty logical, pretty straightforward. I'm not saying it's easy, right? But if, if you follow it and, and you do it on every customer as you make this transition, whether they're new customers or current customers, you'll find that you're going to get better at it. It's because it's like a skill. It's like golf or tennis. The more you do it, the better you get. Absolutely. Yes, that has certainly been my experience. Um, okay, so what steps can people follow to start to make that transition? Step one is the most important, and that's the value conversation. You know, stepping back and not asking the customer what do they need, but asking the customer what are they trying to achieve, right? And really trying to understand at a deep level. This is the time to play diagnostician, right? Just like a doctor, you diagnose before you prescribe because if you prescribe without diagnosis, it's malpractice. So you're really trying to figure out first off if they're a good fit, if you can even help them. Because if you can't help them achieve their end objective, you might be able to do the tasks. But if you can't get them to the outcome that they want, um, then that's not professional. You know, pro the definition of a professional is somebody who takes responsibility for creating an outcome, not delivering a series of tasks. And I think that's a major, a major difference because the problem with the billable hour and the timesheet is it atomizes everything into a task, a six minute task. And we focus on the task and not the outcome. Um, so I think we need to spend more time in diagnosis. We need to ask open ended questions, really try and get a, a clear understanding of what the customer is trying to achieve. Uh, I'll give you a great example of this, Jonathan, and I, and I wish I could claim credit for it. I can't. I give credit to my colleague, Tim Williams, who's an advertising agency consultant. But let's say you're looking for a landscaper and I Google, you know, and I find three landscapers in my area code or whatever. The first one comes out and he's walking around my yard with a clipboard. And of course, he's he in his head, he's thinking a scope of work, right? How big's the lawn, the edging, how many bushes, trees, you know, all of that. Mm -hmm. He turns to me at the end of our tour and he says, Ron, I can do this for 40 bucks an hour. Well, OK, he's charging based on inputs, right? I'm sitting there thinking, OK, are you going to send a bunch of kids over here and it's going to take them, you know, 40 hours a week to do my yard? Uh, and by the way, I've got a small yard. I mean, a, a hungry goat could, could <laughs> handle my yard. I'm just lazy. But the second one comes by. Same thing. He's got the clipboard. He's walking around the yard. He's thinking scope of work, right? And he turns to me, and says, Ron, I can handle all this. I'm $100 a month. OK, a little bit better. He's, he's pricing based on outputs, not inputs. That's better. But the third guy comes out and says, so Ron, tell me about yourself. Oh, I travel a lot. I speak. I, you know, I'm not home a lot. I, I take it. You're not Martha Stewart. You don't like yard work. No, I hate yard work. I absolutely, I don't even like to look at my yard. I don't want to think about it. I don't want to have to spot out problems, nothing. And he's walking around. He's doing the same thing. He's scoping the work in his mind, but he's having a conversation with me. 
And after he asks me a few more questions, he says, I'll tell you what, he says, I'm going to take care of everything. We'll, we'll turn the topsoil a couple times a year. We'll plant different bushes for the different seasons. I'll treat the tree chemically, keep it robust and healthy. Ron, you're not going to have to think about your yard and you're going to have the best curbside appeal in the neighborhood. I'm 250 a month. Who am I going to hire? <laughs> I mean, who did the best job communicating value? Who did the best job understanding value? From my perspective, the outcome I want is I don't want to think about my yard and I want the best curbside appeal. Now, I have to tell you, Jonathan, in all honesty, I've got the second guy. I, I don't think the third guy exists. <laughs> it's a fictitious story because I've never had a landscaper that did what the third guy did. Um, I've, I have to go out and point things out to my current landscaper. It drives me crazy. He's the professional. Mm -hmm. Why isn't he spotting this stuff? Because he's not focused on the outcome. He's focused on the task. Yeah, there's an amazing Seinfeld episode where Jerry gets a carpenter to come in and redo his kitchen. And the guy asks him every single, like every single decision that comes up, he asks Jerry. Do you, do you want this, this, or this? Do you want this? Do you want this kind of wood or that kind of wood? Do you want this kind of pole or that kind of pole? And it drives him insane. And it's hilarious. <laughs> I mean, when you watch it, it's immediately obvious how insane it is. That's but great. That's I what have I, not seen that episode. I yeah, have to look for that. Yeah, that's I'll link great. to it in the show notes. It's a riot. Oh, and, fantastic. And it's how I feel, you know, at least software developers, tr most, most software developers treat their clients. Well, tell me what you want to do. What do you, what do you want me to do? You know, like, a, like they're a voice controlled mouse, like the customer knows how a developer should set up an internal system or an API or a, a, a WordPress site. They don't know. They just want it to work. They want their business outcome. They want to be able to have, they want to be able to sell sneakers online and right. they don't, you know, asking them which typography they prefer. It's irrelevant. It's asking, you know, if you ask someone their opinion, they'll give it to you. But it's kind of a waste of everyone's time, in my opinion. And if they just focus on the outcome, you'd be able to deliver a, a much better experience to the customer and also a, a better result at the end. So, Totally agree. And it's not that the scope of work is not important. It's just that it can't be at the front. The scope of value has to come first because what they're trying to achieve determines the scope of the work. And it's really important to spend as much time as necessary on that diagnostic. Uh, you know, the military has a great saying, time spent in reconnaissance is never wasted. And I, I think the same thing applies here because most professionals are just way too quick to jump in to do the work because that's our comfort zone. That's where, you know, we know what we need to do and we love to do it. So we just dive in. But we need to step back and have this value conversation because if you don't do the value conversation, you're not value pricing. It's like I always say to people, you don't go into a doctor and say, hey, doc, I need a triple bypass. And the doctor goes, sure, jump up on the table. Take off your shirt. Exactly. Let's get started. That'd be malpractice. Absolutely. And, and uh, we, need to, we need to follow the same principles. Excellent. All right. So does that bring us to step two? Yes. The information and knowledge that you gleaned uh, from the conversation comes back into the firm. I advocate that firms have value councils. So they, they have a group of people dedicated to pricing that they do it across the firm and, you know, get a lot of questions from small firms, maybe even a solo firm. Well, how can I have a value council if, you know, I don't have any employees? I say, well, have your spouse do it. Um, you know, your spouse is going to be far more aggressive than, than, than you are because he or she has to live with the consequences of you underpricing yourself. So your spouse is usually brave as a lion, but if that's not, you know, if that's not an option, then, then pick a mentor, pick up uh, your receptionist, pick somebody that you can bounce uh, pricing off of because it can't just be you because we bring way too much baggage to the pricing decisions as owners. And it's, it's very similar to why authors and agents or authors and actors have agents, right? Because they can get them a better price because none of us are good at selling ourselves, And that's what your value council is. They're your agents. They make sure that you maintain your pricing integrity and that pricing is strategic, not tactical. You know, it's not about what price do we need to set to get this job. It's what price is consistent with our firm's strategy, our position in the marketplace, our brand, our identity, our purpose. And somebody needs to monitor that. And so I think it's really important 
to have a value council, the firm's big enough even appoint a chief value officer who has final say over pricing. And and we can I don't know how much you want to get into this, Jonathan. We can get into this a lot because it's a big trend amongst the bigger companies. Like for example, UPS has 225 certified professional pricers on board. And that's all they do is price. These are not marketers. They are not cost accountants. They're not finance people. They're pricers. There's 225 of them. And, you know, that's pretty significant, but they are responsible for pricing all across UPS. And the step two is really about pricing the customer and not the services. We have to get over the idea that we're pricing a series of, of services or, or of tasks because value is subjective. It's like beauty. It's in the eye of the beholder. I always like to say, and this coming from a former accountant, uh, was really hard to get my head around this, but value is not a number. It's a feeling. Mm -hmm. It's a feeling. Get over it. It's a feel. I mean, if you have an Apple product sitting in front of you, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> we all pay a fortune for Apple. <laughs> mm -hmm. There's no justification for it other than it feels good, right? It's a cool brand. What, whatever those feelings might be, it's a feeling. And because no two customers value the same thing, we have to understand uh, that value and price to the customer. And the objection that I always get here, in fact, I'm on a LinkedIn debate with a guy right now, he says, well, you're gouging the customer. No, 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 no. Yeah, I hear that not all gouging the time. The customer. You're, you're offering 100% value guarantee. So if they're not satisfied for whatever reason, they get all their money back. But it, it, it's, it's because you're pricing an outcome it, and no two customers are alike. They're like eyeglass prescriptions. And therefore, you're creating a better experience, I think, for the customer. Sure. I mean, I like to bring up little kids trading toys. You know, two, I, I give this talk about, you know, little girl has a green balloon, little boy has a red balloon. The girl prefers, you know, each prefers the other color. So they just naturally trade. And yep. it's, you know, I, I don't know if you agree with this, but I feel like there's really no fundamental difference between trading two balloons because you like the other color better versus trading $25,000 for a WordPress website because you'd rather have the website than the $25,000. Right. Both sides profit from the right. transaction. No, you're exactly right. In fact, I heard you do that show and, uh, you know, Ed, Ed Kless and I, who I th also think you interviewed for yes. one of your shows, mm -hmm. he, me and him, uh, do the trading game at public events and where we give out gifts and we can't give toys but this game was designed for fifth graders and usually they use toys like balloons and toy, you know, soldiers, tanks, dolls, whatever. And you give everybody a random gift and you have them score their happiness with it on a scale of one to 10. Well, that's just another scale for value. Mm -hmm. And then you tell them at their tables, now you can trade with one another amongst your table. And when they trade, you rescore it. And every single time, and we've done this game hundreds of times, the score goes up. And it goes up dramatically. And then, of course, we let them trade across the entire room. And guess what? The, the score goes up again because value is completely subjective. And so that's why we're pricing the customer and not the services. Oh, I love that story. I hadn't heard that. That's great. It's called the trading game. And, and we've, yeah, we've, we've done it a, a million times and it's just a blast to do. And, and I did it once with high powered CFOs from fortune, you know, 500 companies and it blew their mind because I think a lot of us in business have an attitude that everything's zero sum. Mm -hmm. The more, the more I price the, the less money the customer's going to have, but no, no, it, it's both sides profit from a transaction. And we both walk away winners. And if you want to maximize your price, you first have to maximize your customer's profit from that transaction. Right. And that's what Apple does, if you think about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I, it's, again, preaching to the choir here. <laughs> uh, great example, though. And then, the, and then so you, when you price the customer, part of that, now we're going into the third step, mm -hmm. which is the value council developing and pricing options. So just like American Express offers us a green card, gold card, platinum card, we should offer our customers choices because I, I don't know why it is. Every other business on the planet gives us choices. I bet where people go and get their car washed, you have three options. And, but when it comes to most professional services, 
we just give one price, take it or leave it. Or worse, we give an hourly rate, which isn't, is, isn't even a price, or we give a range. And of course, that sets us up for failure because the customer hears the low end. Mm-hmm. When we quote a range, we hear the high end. When we price <laughs> somewhere in the middle, they, they're still upset. So I used to say, um, if you're smart enough to come up with a range at the start of a job, just quote the high end and shut up. But my mind has been changed on this 180 degrees. Now I say, offer that range, but do it with options. So offer a green card, a gold card, a platinum card, to, to use the American Express uh, you know, terms. But So the customer has to make that value price trade-off. We humans love choices. And when you put three choices in front of a, a customer, a human brain, the question is not anymore, should I hire uh, Jonathan or should I work with Jonathan? It's how should I work with Jonathan? Because they're trying to figure out which option is right. And that's really powerful mindset change. And we need to get better at offering options to our customers. And that's what step three is all about. Agreed. I, are you, I'm assuming that you have specifically chosen the number three and aren't just using it as an arbitrary number. I think I, I agree that I think three is is the perfect number, or if that's what you're saying. I think two is better than one, but I think three is better than two. And you know, if you start offering lots of options, it can get a little overwhelming. I think, but I've I have personally found that three is the magic number. Nope, you're dead right. In fact, that's why pricers call it Goldilocks pricing. <laughs> it's it's the it's the perfect number. Um, on you know, it's funny when when and there's been all sorts of behavioral economic experiments on this and just real world experiments. It's so easy now to run these with A B, you know, Google, whatever, uh, to do these trials. But when you put two choices in front of us, most of the time we'll pick the lowest price of the two. When you put three choices in front of us, we'll pick the middle option usually. And the difference is when you put two options in front of somebody, they make a price decision. When you put three options in front of somebody, they make a value decision. And that's a big difference. So I never, I tell people never use two options. If you're going to experiment with this, I mean, use, you've got to use three. You just have to. Otherwise, be prepared if you put out two to have the lowest price always picked. And that with three options, sometimes, you know, people pick the platinum option. Um, they they uh, pick the, the lowest priced option usually around 10 percent of the time. It, it varies depending on the industry we're talking about. But uh, three options is definitely the way to go. And I totally agree. You can you can give too many options and paralyze somebody and they won't make a choice. And I think, you know, I think I, I know many firms that have four options. Kind of like American Express, you know, they've got the black card. Of course, it's invitation only, so not everybody gets that option. And some firms have copied that model. Um, But anything beyond four, I think you're really risking paralyzing a customer into a non-decision. Absolutely. So, and and there are, and and the other thing I want to deal with, because this always comes up talking to professionals, and I'm sure software developers aren't aren't any different. They, we, the objection we hear about offering options is. Well, wait a minute. Are you saying that, you know, if they buy the green card, the cheapest priced option, that their stuff, you know, might work half the time? I mean, it will be kludgy. We'll kind of do a, you know, half ass job. No, not at all. I'm taking the technical quality as a given, right? Just like an airline has to land safely for all passengers, no matter if they're sitting in first class, business class or coach or a price line seat. So the technical quality is a given. What we're differentiating on are service aspects. Things like timing, how fast do they want the job done? Things like um, payment terms, you know, lower price, you get paid faster. Uh, Talent, who's going to do the work? What technology are you going to offer? Um, uh, How are you going to uh, deliver this, um, you know, intellectual capital to your customer? All these types of things revolve around service not the technical quality of what you do. So I just wanted to clarify that or, or make that really apparent because a, a lot of professionals think that, you know, we're talking about cutting quality standards by offering different options and we're not. Exactly. Yep. Sometimes I include in that uh, increased access to the 
in, in my case, me. So if, if you're the uh, principal in the firm and you can add a, a premium option where you can pick up the phone and call me and I will answer, which is not something that most people, most clients necessarily have access to. Uh, right. So yeah, but that's a great point that quality is not, is not variable. It needs to be, it needs to be high. So, right. It's a given, right. It's taken as a, it's a table stake, you know, it's like having bathrooms. I mean, you gotta <laughs> have it to be able to compete. Right. <clears throat> so then the fourth option or the fourth step in the process, you develop your, your options, you price them. Now you present them to the customer. And this is where, you know, the, some other behavioral economic research comes into play. I think you should lead off with your most expensive option first. So a popular format for this is column, you know, put it in columns and on the left hand side, of course, because we read from left to right, then you have your most expensive option first. And this is also where you might get pricing objections from the customer, like things like, well, gee, Jonathan, why are you 30 percent more than the other firm I talked to, you know, with respect to this project or got a quote from and you know what? I've been doing this for 20 something years. I haven't heard a new pricing objection in all that time. I mean, there's a finite number of objections. We better have answers to all of them. And the way you overcome pricing objections is you demonstrate value. You reiterate that access. You reiterate the fixed price. We're not giving you an hourly rate. We're assuming the risk on that. We're giving you certainty in price. We're using change requests and change orders so we never surprise you if something happens that's outside of scope, just like an auto mechanic or a contractor, we offer a value guarantee. I mean, all of these things reiterate your value and communicate your value. And most of the time, when you put three options in front of somebody, it really almost eliminates negotiation. Because after all, if they want a cheaper price, buy the cheapest option. Mm -hmm. I actually do something in the value conversation I just make it evident that I'm not going to be the cheapest option. I'll come straight out and tell them and say, yep. you know, look, I kind of try and talk them out of working with me where I'll say like, why don't you just hire someone cheaper? I mean, I am going to be probably your most expensive option. Why even bother talking to me? Why not either do it internally or outsource it to uh, Costa Rica or you know, whatever? And they'll explain to me why they thought about that and decided against it. But I, I suppose that that is... Yeah, I suppose being able to have that kind of conversation isn't something you can do just starting out because I have credibility indicators that the average person starting out aren't, isn't, isn't going to have, you know, writing books and uh, having big clients and that sort of thing. But, uh, it, that has been a really effective approach. I, I still think you can do it. Your, your ability to close the sale might be a little trickier or at least get out of the value conversation successfully. If you just straight up tell them you're not going to be the lowest price. Another thing I'll do is I'll say, well, because if we're talking about software development, virtually everyone who you're competing against or everyone else who's going to be sending in or answering an RFP, virtually all of them are going to be giving an hourly estimate. And if I did get an objection where someone said, oh, well, you know, you're twice as expensive as the, as the next person, I'll say, well, did the next person give you a price or an estimate? <laughs> right. And they'll say, oh yeah, you're right. And I'm like, well, I mean, I suppose you know that something like 50% of all software projects go over budget by a hundred percent. So, you know, would you rather have that insurance of hiring me and knowing up front that I'm taking that risk for you or, you know, rolling the dice with one of these other people? Right. I know. I think, I, you know, that's brilliant. You're absolutely right. And I love, uh, you know, we call it testing your price early, whether you say I'm not the cheapest software developer in town or, or whatever, but it, it, isn't it interesting that when you take two or three steps back, they take five steps towards you. <laughs> they want you even more, you mm -hmm. know, when, when you, when you, when you do that. Um, I also think so much of this too, so much of pricing is a game played between your ears. You know, it, it's about your sense of self, whether you call it self esteem or self respect or, or whatever. But you know, I believe there's great nobility in being paid what you're worth and we'll never get paid more than we think we're worth. And if we don't think we're worth it, our customers never will either. Right. For sales to yourself. Absolutely. So that, that step four is presenting your, you know, your options, ha handling any price objections. Step five is really simple. The customer picks a choice and you develop some type of 
you know, agreement. I, I don't like to call them contracts because it brings up lawyers and courts, you know, in the, in the minds of people. So I, I always like to say authorize the agreement rather than sign the contract. You know, it sounds, it sounds a lot less threatening. Um, and, and that, you know, that agreement is going to have the price might have the scope. It might have things that the customer has to supply to you. If you're going to depend on them for some of their resources that could be in there. Um, all of that and payment terms, payment terms are really important because they're just another word for pricing. You've got to have payment terms structured on all your options and all your pricing. Um, and then the sixth step is just doing good project management. Um, this is something Ed Kless is a specialist at has taught me a lot about, but I think project management is critical no matter how you price, even if you're billing by the hour. We need to do good project management, and I think one of the problems we have as, as professionals is we rely on the billable hour and the timesheet to do our project management, and that's insane mm. because by the time you see something on the timesheet, it's by definition no longer manageable. It, it It's like timing your cookies with a smoke alarm. <laughs> it, it just makes no sense. And so proper, so I separate project management from pricing. I think they're totally different skills. and. Usually people who are good at project management aren't very good at pricing and vice versa. The only guy I know who can cross both bridges is Ed. Um, but, it, it, you know, I, I think this is a skill that everybody needs no matter how you price. It's just how is work going to move through the firm? You know, are we going to be able to deliver uh, based on the deadlines that we promised to our customer? Mm -hmm. and, and that requires you to look forward, not backwards. Um, and then the seventh step is when scope creep does arise and, you know, it'd it be kind of, uh, it, it's probably true. I'm not, not as familiar with software developers, Jonathan, but I, I gotta believe that in your world, it'd be kind of twilight zone weird if there wasn't some scope creep in your projects, things that, you know, maybe the customer changed their mind about something or you ran across something that you didn't anticipate. And that's when we use uh, change requests and change orders, just like a contractor, just like an auto mechanic. We have a conversation with the customer. We talk about it and it doesn't always mean a price changes. It could just mean that we push back the deadline of going live or, or we change the quality. Um, it's a fallacy to think the price always changes, although n normally it does with the scope creep. Um, but the other insidious thing that I see amongst a lot of firms is something called scope seep, which is S E E P, which is when we do something that the customer never asked for that adds tremendous value. And, and I got to say, I see that a lot. I might see that more than I see scope creep. Right. Yeah. And the, in the software development world, we call it gold plating when yes. you do something that nobody asked for. Beautiful. And, I love it. Yeah. The, the, the lawyers call it chasing down, you know, every rabbit down the hole or something. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, scope creep is a constant specter with software developers. And in fact, it's probably the, the first rational argument. It's the first thing that the rational brain objects to in the mind of a software developer when they hear, when they understand that value pricing involves you giving a fixed price. And they're like, oh, no, I tried fixed prices once and I got burned. And I'll almost yeah. always say, well, let me guess. You calculated, you estimated how many hours it's going to take you. You multiplied those out. You tacked on some padding, some random amount of padding. And uh, and you got killed by both scope creep and the fact that you underestimated it in the first place. And then you never tried it again. Yeah, that's exactly. Those are the two biggest causes for why people say they you know, would have made more with the hourly rate. That's because they, they underpriced it to begin with and they didn't catch scope creep. Mm -hmm. it, it's a huge fallacy to think that just because you're giving a fixed price that you're not scoping, of course you're scoping. Um, but, and, and that scope has to be very clear. Um, but there also has to be some judgment in there because you don't want to nickel and dime your customers with change orders. I mean, if you're triggering a ton of change orders, that means you're doing a really crappy diagnostic job. Mm -hmm. And that's why that, that scope of value and that value conversation back to step one is so important. Yeah. I, I tend to recommend, at least in the software development world, that people in the diagnostic, they focus really hard on defining the, the desired outcome and how they're going to measure progress toward that. And if you do that, that kind of thing uh, is usually defined at a fairly high level in the organization. And it's not the kind of goal that's going to just randomly change every quarter. It's usually right. a, a kind of an evergreen kind of goal. And 
having that is is your armor or your litmus test or the context that you can put all of these things that turn into scope, these random feature requests. You can put them into context and validate them against the goal of the project and say, well, that's a great idea, Mr. Sales Manager, about putting a carousel at the top of the homepage. How is that going to help us decrease card abandonment rate on mobile phones? And they'll say, well, it doesn't have anything to do with that. And you'll say, it's a great idea. I've got it written down here, but let's make sure that we cross the finish line on the goal at hand. And then we can come back and we can talk about this other feature. It's ext- I, have, I have literally never, using that approach, I've literally never had to issue a change order. Excellent. You know, one of the things, um, usually you, you talk about a change request first because it's kind of like a purchase request and a purchase order. Anybody in a company can request a new laptop, but <laughs> until it's approved, uh, it, it doesn't become a, a purchase order. Sure. And it's the same thing with the change request. And one of the great questions to ask in that change request phase is what's the business purpose for this? And if you think about that, that's just another way of asking, what's the value? Exactly. And that I, lo- I love that approach. And so that's step seven is de- the whole change request and and uh, change order. I've got a, uh, I wish I could show this. It's hard to show things on a podcast, but I've got a picture of a boat and it's a real boat. So I thought it was Photoshopped. It's not. It's a contractor's boat and it's called change order. And the little dinghy is called original contract. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll send it to you so you can put it in your show notes. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a great picture. Um, but and, and then the last step in the process, and one often overlooked, unfortunately, but if firms are really serious about really making this transition, then I think we have to do a pricing after action review. So this would be the value council sitting down after the engagement's over. If, if you think about a closed engagement, there's a wealth of information in there. We know, you know, if we had the right team involved, we know if, if we met the deadline to the customer, we know if the customer's happy, we have a sense of cost to serve, even if it's just a rough estimate, it's close enough. We have a sense of, um, you know, how price sensitive is the customer now? I mean, are they over the moon with our work or were they upset? Did they complain? All of these things need to be analyzed from a pricing perspective. So we can ask ourselves, did we leave any money on the table? If we had to do this over again, would we do it? Would we have priced it differently? Would we have used a different pricing strategy? Uh, And if you do that after every single engagement, and maybe not after every single, maybe follow the 2080 rule here, you know, focus on the 20% of your engagements that generate the bulk of your revenue. Um, But if you do that, that's how we develop a core competency. It's not just by pricing. It's by pricing and then reviewing our pricing after the fact. And and that's where you learn the lessons. And that, and that's why we love the term after action reviews because we stole it from the U.S. Army. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they AAR everything because they never want to build the same bridge twice. They want to learn from their mistakes and their successes. And that's how you build up a competency in pricing. Mm. So all of those eight steps are kind of interrelated and interdependent. But if you follow them, then they're going to become second nature. And this is just going to become part of the cultural DNA in a firm. Sure. With a, with a built in sort of virtuous cycle where you continue to get better at it. Exactly. Excellent. So I know you're a busy guy. We have to wrap up shortly. Um, but there's one thing that I, uh, you mentioned that I'd like to loop back to quickly. If you could just sort of give us your, your take on it. Uh, I know that this strikes fear in the hearts of all software developers. Uh, you mentioned guarantees. What can you say to folks about guarantees? Great question. Uh, first off, read the book by Christopher Hart called Extraordinary Guarantees, a Harvard business professor that has done a ton of research on service firms that offer guarantees. And the list is is quite long. Um, you know, if, if we just think about uh, great, great companies that we admire, Nordstrom, Amazon, Disney, you know, FedEx, um, these all have stellar guarantees. Um, but the other thing is, I, I would say that I always say to firms that are really fearful of this is that first off, you're already doing it because if a customer complained loudly enough, what would you do? You'd make it right. You already do it. So 
you're doing it. It's just covert. It's like the CIA. Nobody knows about it. Um, <laughs> I want you to make it over. I want you to put it on the side of your plane like Fred Smith did at FedEx. You know, absolutely, positively overnight. Get get some marketing muscle for it. Get get a competitive differentiation for it, and also get a price premium for it. Because I think a service that's guaranteed is worth more than a service that's not. Now, what's the spread? Well, look at the difference between price between, say, FedEx and UPS, right? Mm -hmm. It's 20 or 30 percent. Look at the price of Gore-Tex, L.L. Bean, Nordstrom. You know, they get a premium for having the stellar guarantee. Zappos, too, by the way, Amazon, all of that. Um, and so if, if somebody – so you're self-insuring. If one idiot pulls the trigger on your guarantee, unjustifiably so, fine, pay them off. I think they just did the firm a huge favor by identifying themselves as an F customer. You know, pay them off and, and let them go. But realize that you're getting a 20 or 30 percent price increase across every other job that's going to more than compensate for the one person who pulls the trigger. And to be honest, most people will never pull the trigger or have the trigger pulled on them. And when they do, it's usually for a justifiable reason. We screwed up mm -hmm. or we missed the deadline or something. And most of the time, the, the customer asks for a lot less than we would have been willing to give them. So there's all sorts of really good reasons to do the guarantee. But I guess I'd say the biggest one is you already do it. Yes. So let me let me sort of contextualize that for the typical software developer. So, you know, I, obviously everybody's familiar with Amazon and all the brands that you mentioned and they're very and they probably enjoy the security that they get from knowing that they can, you know, return things to uh, Amazon, for example. But those are extremely high volume businesses and the the, you know, a typical software developer, solo or small firm, they might have three big clients a year, three really big projects a year. And literally one of them would put it, put them probably out of business or at least have their worst year ever if they had to refund the money. So I, I wanted to point out a couple of things about that. One is that having just a few large projects a year is a bad idea. Uh, you can have, you can set yourself up with sort of packages, productized services that you can offer many, many, many in a year where you're, you're offering the same kind of service repeatedly to all, you know, not all sorts of different kinds of clients, but all sorts of clients. And you can charge an extremely profitable, you can charge a price that's extremely profitable so that you kind of put yourself in that category that Ron just described where you can, you know, one out of a hundred or 500 people ask for a refund just because they're a clown, or maybe you did really screw something up. It's not going to put you out of business. And, and exactly like Ron said, all of that, all of that, the rest of the time, you're able to charge a 20, 30% premium for everyone else to offer them that sort of peace of mind. And you're going to close more sales, make more money from each sale. And uh, it, so your, your benefit the odds are really high that your benefit is is going to play out largely in your favor, like dramatically in your favor, if you can increase the number of clients involved. I think if I think the reason people get scared or developers get scared is because they're imagining, you know, geez, I did three projects this year. They're each thirty thousand dollars or fifty thousand dollars, and if I had to give a hundred percent refund on one of those, I'd be looking for a full time job. Right. No, and I and I understand that, and I and there are ways to deal with that and still offer the guarantee. If if you structure payment terms, let's just say those three jobs, you know, are paying quarterly or monthly for some period of time, you could say we'll assume you're satisfied at the receipt of every payment, so it's closed off. They can't go retroactively get you know, the money they paid you in the past. They can only not pay a future payment. Um, and therefore you don't put everything at risk. Yeah, that's great. And that's the kind of thing. Well, I suppose you could do that if you're still billing hourly, but regardless, that's a good way to kind of gate it and, and sort of be able to offer that peace of mind and still be able to benefit from, uh, or protect yourself from a catastrophic loss. Well, you know, it's so funny with hourly billing, uh, not only, not only do we offer that guarantee, but, uh, it, it's the triggers being pulled all the time. And, and the empirical proof is nobody's realizing a hundred percent of their hourly rate because we're writing down and writing off more than we're writing up. And that's because we're billing in arrears. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I always ask firms, when do you want to find out the customer doesn't like your price before you do the work or after? <laughs> 
because after there's not much you can do except write down and write off and probably still have an unhappy customer, which, which is why I got into this whole thing in the first place, because I was tired of that conversation because there was no good end to it. When they come in or call me and say, why didn't you tell me it was going to be this much? My only response was I spent the time and that conversation never ended well. Sometimes I'd lose the customer. Other times I'd write off the bill completely. Other times I'd, I'd write it down partially. But even if they stayed, the relationship took a hit in terms of trust. And it, it, it just it doesn't end well no matter how you do it. So, uh, you know, I always say that I'm more concerned with how firms price than, than necessarily what the price is. Because I think the how is more important than the what here. And, and that means price up front and offer options. And if you follow these eight steps, I do think it will, will turn you into a very competent pricer. Fabulous. Well, that's probably a good place to leave it. Where can people go online to find out more? They can find me at verisage.com, which is a think tank that I've established to get these ideas out there in the public across all sectors and around the world. And there's lots, of, lots and lots and lots of information up there, all free and all readily available. And also uh, my own radio show that I do with Ed Class. Um, is the soul of enterprise.com you can listen to all of our uh, shows archived up there right on that page or you can get it on iTunes stitcher whatever and we have all we, we've been on the air now for two years we've done 110 shows or something had lots of guests we talk about pricing we talk about the knowledge economy talk about all sorts of things with interesting guests so lots of uh, Lots of good content up there. And I'm also one of the uh, LinkedIn influencer bloggers. And I'm on Twitter at Ronald Baker. And you can email me at ron at verisage.com. I'm happy to uh, help folks in any way I can, Jonathan, amongst your listeners. So thanks for having me on. It's, it's been terrific. Oh, it's really been my, my pleasure and my honor. Well, I, keep up the great work. <laughs> I, I love what you're doing with the podcast. I'm, I'm a regular listener. I love it. If you bill by the hour and would like to learn how to significantly increase your income, please go to valuepricingbootcamp.com to sign up for my free email course. Again, that URL is valuepricingbootcamp.com.